Welcome to the fifth module of eleventh week. This entire week we are lo looking at waves in optical systems. In particular, in the last four classes, we mostly concentrated on uh, interference patterns. In this class, we look at diffraction, and uh, there's one problem that we had left incomplete in one of our previous classes, especially the one of calculating the resolving power of uh, Fabry-Ferro Fabry interferometer. So, let me explain diffraction with the figure that I have here. So, let us assume that there is a light wave front that is coming from the left hand side and it is a plane wave front and it is falling on this slit whose width is B. If light were exactly traveling in straight lines, what you would expect is that if I map the slit to a screen a little bit away from the position of the slit, I can mark these two positions S1 and S2 as you will see here S1 and S2. So, if light were actually traveling in straight lines, only that portion between S1 and S2 would be uniformly lit up and outside of S1 and S2, the screen would be completely dark. This is what you would expect. On the other hand, what is generally seen is that under some conditions, there is in fact light falling outside of S1 and S2, that is one thing. And secondly, if your wavelength of light is approximately equal to the size of the slit, which we have taken to be B, then it is also noticed that the intensity of light, which we expected to be uniform earlier on, is not really uniform within S1 and S2. So, there are some bright and dark fringes. It is not uniformly distributed inside S1 and S2 and diffraction effect cannot be explained with ray approach alone. So, if you remember, we used ray approach to explain reflection and refraction and that is basically the limit of uh, wavelength of light tending to 0 and that approach would not be suitable here because we need to work with again waves interfering with one another. So, we really need the full wave phenomena. So, we need to consider non-zero wavelength of light. What is the difference between interference and diffraction? So, I have tried to show that with these two figures here. One common way of looking at interference is the two slit Young's experiment kind of interference pattern. So, on the left hand side, I have this double slit interference setup. So, you have light coming from the left hand side, there is a wave front and there are two slits as you can see and the wave front part of the wave front passes through the two slits and maybe at some point P at the screen, we want to know what is the, what is the intensity of light that is received at point P on the screen. So, the way one would work is you take into account the light ray coming from one of the top slit and the bottom slit, find out what is the path difference, convert it into phase difference and then you can decide whether what you are going to see would be a bright or a dark fringe at position P. This is interference for us. So, there are these two beams from different slits, two different slits, it is very important. So, there are these two beams coming from two different slits which interact with one another and produce the interference pattern at P. On the other hand, you see this diffraction setup on the right hand side. I have this single slit setup. So, again it is the same thing, light comes from the left hand side. You can assume if you like that it is a plane wave. The light passes through the single slit. And again the question is what would I see at some position P and obviously this position P is exaggerated. So, ideally I would like to look at what happens maybe in this region. But in any case the point here is that here we are again looking at two 
wavelets or two beams which come not from two different slits but from different parts of the same slit. So, look at the diagram that I have drawn here. So, there are these two lines which emerge from two parts of the same slit. Then we ask the question if these are the two beams, how would they interact and would they produce a bright or a dark fringe at position P. So, that is diffraction. So, if you think about it, it is not so much of a difference between interference and diffraction. In particular, you would notice that there is really no difference in physical behavior. Let me say that there are two broad classes of diffraction problems. So, the first of them is the Fraunhofer diffraction. So, in this case, let us say that uh, diffraction happens at this position of single slit which is shown in red color here, this one. Now, you have a source of light which comes really from far distance, in principle infinity, but you should imagine that the source of light is really far from us that I can almost assume that when this light reaches the slit, it is a plane wave. But you do not necessarily need long distance to produce a plane wave, you could also have this effect happening at very short distance by using a lens for example, and if you place your object at the focus of the lens, you will render it in parallel on the other side. So, for example, you can keep the source of light at the focus of the lens and that would give you parallel rays or essentially plane wave front. And now, once the waves pass out through the slit, the screen is again assumed to be really far enough. In principle, at a distance which is infinity but in practice it is fairly large distance. And the reason as you will see is that these help in making some angles small and certain approximations work very well and help us in computing analytical forms for the diffraction pattern easily, which is one reason. But more important than just the mathematical convenience is the fact that this is something that that is also most useful in practice. The second class of diffraction pattern is the Fresnel diffraction pattern. So, here as opposed to Fraunhofer case, this d 1 and d 2 which represent the distance from the source and distance to the screen, they are not infinite, they are kept really reasonably close to the place where diffraction takes place. In this case, the waves cannot be assumed to be plane waves. So, hence dealing with Fresnel diffraction at a theoretical level is somewhat more difficult than dealing with Fraunhofer diffraction. I am going to particularly concentrate on Fraunhofer diffraction of a diffraction pattern arising from a single slit. So, here is a sort of enlarged diagram of the same thing. I assume that the incoming waves are plane and the slit I have has a width b. This is, this is the width b which is marked in the figure and this thick dark lines that you see these ones here that is your slit. The open region is the slit black region will block off the light from going ahead. And I have this screen S yes, at the far right and the question I ask is often what is it that I will see at position P on the screen S. Yes. To bring all the waves into focus I use a lens like the one that is shown here. So, what we will do is begin by dividing the 
width of the slit. So, width of the slit is b, we will divide it into n equal smaller regions and size of each of the smaller regions is delta. So, the entire width b can be written as delta multiplied by n minus 1. So, let us say that a 1, a 2 that I have here is one such small width delta. So, what I am going to do is to consider a ray which is leaving from the point a 1 and another ray which is leaving from the point a 2 and the one that is travelling from a 1 makes an angle theta with the horizontal at that point. Now, let us look at this, this region in some detail to understand the geometry. So, I have enlarged this, this part and shown it here. So, A 1 and A 2 you can see here, a black line is drawn and that has a width delta the way that we identified a while before. And this is of course, the ray that travels here like this and there is a second ray from A 2 which is originating and uh, travelling in this direction. And now, if I drop a perpendicular from the point A 1 onto this ray which is going from A 2, it will make an angle theta. the same theta that that you see here. So, the path difference which I am interested in is given by this quantity a 2 a 2 prime is delta sin theta as simple as that. Now, that I know the path difference, it is easy and straightforward to calculate the phase difference. So, the phase difference phi is equal to 2 pi by lambda multiplied by the path difference which in this case is delta times sin theta. So, now what I want to find is what is the field at p due to wave that is emanating from position a 1 and from position a 2. So, let me assume that since it is a wave, it should be solution of a wave equation and let me assume the solution to be a sin omega t. So, it is something that is propagating towards the screen and for the one that is propagating from position a 2, it is the same a sin omega t, but there is a phase lag because of the path difference, because of the path difference a 2 a 2 prime there is a phase lag and we have already calculated that phase phi. So, I can take that to be a cos omega t minus phi and now you can actually keep doing this because if you go back and look at this figure you will see that I have defined a point A 3, which is at a distance delta from, from A 2 and there will be an A 4, which is at a distance delta from A 3 and so on. So, as we have defined there would be n of these n minus 1 gaps basically. So, each one would maintain a phase difference of phi with the predecessor. For example, from A 3, A 3 will maintain a phase difference of 2 phi with respect to the wave emanating from A 1. So, in which case I could have written the field at P due to wave starting from position A 3 as A cos omega t minus 2 phi and so on. So, now I need to calculate the resultant at p because there are these waves coming from a 1, a 2, a 3, a 4 and so on up to a n or a n minus 1 and they all are converging at p. So, I would like to know what is the resultant field at p. So, that would be simply be a vector sum, sum of all these uh, a cos phi, a cos omega t minus phi and so on. So, which is what I have written down here. So, now what I need to do is to do this sum. 
So, I have rewritten that sum here. So, it is a cos omega t plus a cos omega t minus phi and so on up to a cos omega t minus n minus 1 phi. You can do this sum by considering a geometric series. For example, what you could do is to write something like this e power i omega t minus n phi and sum it over n small n going from 0 to capital N minus 1. But what we want to sum over these cos terms, but this e power i omega t has cos plus it will be cos omega t plus i sin omega t. So, it has the real part which is the cos term and the imaginary part which is the sin term. So, finally, after you do the sum, you just take the real part of the answer that will give you this summation. So, I mean just to indicate one more step of how it should be done, you can take e power i omega t outside because it is not part of the summation n equal to 0 to n minus 1 e power minus i n phi. So, this quantity here, this summation here is a geometric series. So, sum to n terms of a geometric series is a well known quantity, just apply that sum, you will get the final result and after that take the real part of that, you should get this answer. And as you can see, when I want to calculate the intensity, all I am interested in is this quantity A0, which is the amplitude and I have extracted this quantity A0. So, now I am going to assume that phi is small enough. So, I want to know what is n phi by 2 in the first place. So, n phi by 2 is just put in, we know what is phi, just put in everything and if you assume that or take the limit that n tends to infinity, which is like saying that the divisions are getting smaller and smaller or in other words, the delta that we define here gets smaller and smaller as n tends to infinity. So, after all delta will be equal to b divided by n minus 1. So, as n tends to infinity, b will be getting, uh, delta will be getting to 0. So, which is the idea that we use here and in this case, n delta is simply equal to b itself. So, we are just putting back b in the formula and now I have n phi by 2 to be equal to pi by lambda into b sin theta. Now, if you take the limit of delta tending to 0 for the phase difference phi, then it turns out that phase phi goes to 0. After all, phi is 2 pi by lambda into delta multiplied by sin theta. So, if delta is going to 0, phi will have to go to 0. So, now let us assemble all these information together in A0. So, A0 is this formula here, which came from what we wrote down earlier. And what I have done here is to multiply and divide by n. So, A is multiplied and divided by n and then you have that sin n phi by 2. And since we are going to look at the limit delta tending to 0, then in that case phi also tends to 0. So, sin phi by 2 will be just phi by 2 that is approximating sin theta as theta. But in the numerator we cannot write sin of n phi by 2 to be n phi by 2 because while phi tends to 0, n phi by 2 does not tend to 0. So, what we do is to use this relation that we just calculated for n phi by 2. So, you plug that in in this equation and then many things will cancel out and now you can write this expression for a 0 as small a times n sin beta by beta, where beta is this quantity which is pi times b multiplied by sin theta by lambda. Now, I can write the expression for y. So, it is equal to a n into sin beta by beta. So, this is my amplitude a 0 times the usual other term which is the cos term. So, the in intensity distribution is just the square of this quantity. 
So, I can uh, write it as I 0 into sin square beta by beta square. So, now you can ask when will it give me a dark fringe, when will, when will it give me a bright fringe. So, first case is when will intensity be 0 or dark fringe. So, that will happen if as you can see from this formula if beta is equal to m times pi m is an integer, but m should not be equal to 0 because if m were equal to 0 the denominator also would get to 0 in this case. That gives me the condition that b sin theta should be equal to m lambda for intensity minima and here m is again integer plus or minus 1 plus or minus 2 and so on. Now, what happens if m is equal to 0? So, in that case beta is equal to 0. So, you can put m equal to 0 in this formula, beta will be equal to 0 and in that limit this quantity sin square beta by beta square goes to 1 and what I will have is a maxima, a maxima at the center m equal to 0. So, if I plot intensity as a function of beta, there is going to be a maxima at m equal to 0 that is this point as you can see and then there is going to be a decay and the decay is of the form of square of sin beta by beta. So, it looks like the kind of intensity patterns that we have seen before, it is of the form sin theta by theta, but it is square of that quantity. Next we will go to the problem that we decided to take up in this last module that is the resolving power of a fabry perot interferometer. So, let me very quickly go through the fabry perot interferometer. So, it consists of this etalon. So, there is light coming from one direction and it undergoes multiple reflection and also partial transmission on the other side. So, you are asking the question what would I see on the other side due to multiple beams that are emerging out of the etalon. So, that is the question. So, we worked out the result for for the fabry perot interferometer. We saw in particular that it has very high sensitivity in the sense that when you plot intensity as a function of the interference order, the peaks are very sharp for the cases when the reflection coefficient capital R is sufficiently large. But the question that we are now trying to address is what is the resolving power. In other words, the question is if you go back to this interferometer itself, suppose I had two wavelengths of light that enter the etalon and individually both of them will create separate interference pattern like the one that is shown in this figure. And if you assume that the two wavelengths are very close to each other, the question is can I resolve them, can I see them as separate peaks in the interference pattern due to fabry perot interferometer. So, here I have drawn the intensity versus order figure. So, this continuous curve is for the wavelength of light lambda or interference produced by wavelength lambda and the other one the dashed line is for uh, interference produced by wavelength lambda minus delta lambda. So, they, they are offset by a small distance delta m in the space of order m. So, we will say that for our purposes the fringes are well resolved when, when, the, when they cross each other at i equal to i max by 2. So, i is the intensity on the y axis. So, I have these two fringes, the one with continuous curve and one with the dashed curve. So, when they move apart, half the values of the peak intensity, so peak intensity is i max for both of them and half their values they cross at this point. So, when they do that, then we will say that that is the criteria for us for having resolved two close wavelengths. So, the starting point here is the intensity uh, formula or the transmitted intensity 
which we derived entirely in the last module. So, if I identify t square by 1 minus r square as i max, then this entire formula that I have i t can be written like this. This underscore t, this small t here is to imply that intensity of the transmitted beam. So, you can easily see that if delta is equal to 0, if the phase difference is 0, then i t is equal to i max because if delta is equal to 0, this entire term in the denominator would go to 0 and there would, that would leave it with only 1 in the denominator. Hence, i t is equal to i max. On the other hand, if this entire term is equal to 1, in that case, the transmitted intensity is equal to i max by 2. And what we know is that these kind of fringes are visible only if the phase difference is sufficiently small or in other words, we need to work in the limit of delta going to 0, in which case I can always approximate sin delta by 2 to be equal to delta by 2. Then let me look at this term which is 4 r into sin square delta by 2 divided by 1 minus r square. So, all I have done is to simply approximate sin square delta by 2 by delta square by 4 simply because sin delta by 2 is equal to delta by 2 and square of this quantity is delta by 2 whole square that is delta square by 4. Now, I want to find out what is the value of uh, delta if this has to be equal to 1. It is very easy to do that. So, delta square by 4 in that case would be equal to 1 minus r whole square divided by 4 r. So, you can cancel off 4 and 4. So, delta half if we call it that way would be equal to square root of this and that would be 1 minus r divided by square root of r. This is the phase change when this quantity 4 r into sin square delta by 2 divided by 1 minus r square equals 1 and that is the condition when i t is i max by 2. Basically, it is the condition when we would say that two wavelengths are well resolved. So, what we know is for mth order of interference 2 d cos theta is m lambda. Again, refer back to the previous lecture, we have seen this. 2 d cos theta is m lambda, we derived it in, in its full uh, detail. So, here you should note that both d and theta are constants. So, in that case, now if I ask for variation on both side or in other words, I take a delta. So, this delta is basically like taking a variation of quantities which are variable. So, delta of 2 d cos theta would be 0 because d is a constant, theta is a constant. So, they cannot be varied. So, left hand side is 0, but if I take delta of m lambda that I have here, in that case that you can calculate because both m and lambda are variables. So, that will be m into delta lambda plus lambda into delta m and left hand side is 0. So, that quantity is entirely equal to 0. So, by simple manipulation you will get a relation between m delta m lambda and delta lambda. So, in other words now we know that there is this relation between how much of change in wavelength corresponds to how much of change in order. But what we know is if delta m is equal to 1, the phase change is 2 pi. So, go back to this figure. So, I have m here and I have m plus 1 here. So, if m changes by unit value, the change in phase is 2 pi. Now, if the phase change is 2 into delta half some number that we know, then to what delta m would it correspond to? That is the question and that is very easy. Delta m is 2 times delta half divided by 2 pi. 
and the definition of resolving power standard definition is lambda by delta lambda. When I say resolving power is large, it means that I can differentiate between two wavelengths which are which differ by delta lambda. So, smaller the delta lambda is or smaller the delta lambda that I can differentiate better is the resolution. You can see that delta lambda by lambda will be equal to delta m by m and since we are interested in the magnitude we can ignore the negative sign take the modulus of m by delta m. Then we just need to put in the values. So, m is the order and delta m can be now written in terms of this relation. So, that will be 2 delta half into divided by 2 pi and delta half itself was just now calculated to be this one 1 minus r by square root of r. So, if you put all these things here it will turn out that your it will turn out that your resolving power is m pi times root r divided by 1 minus r. So, it depends on reflection coefficient. If r is sufficiently small then the resolving power is going to be fairly high. Let me close this session by saying that we studied the diffraction pattern. Diffraction is not too distinct from interference, it is physically not different, it is only a question of scale and we looked at the diffraction pattern due to a single slit and we went through the usual calculation by dividing the slit into n parts and looking at waves coming from each of those and finding out the resultant due to all of them. Finally, it turns out that you will get an diffraction pattern that is of this type. And then we went ahead to calculate the resolving power of a Fabry Perot interferometer, a problem that we had left incomplete in one of the earlier classes and it turns out that the resolving power depends on R which is the intensity of reflection in a Fabry-Perot atom.